This is all really important. And it also raises a question about individual differences in sweating ability. And I call it sweating ability because uh, I have a good friend I've known for ages, really. Um, actually work with him in my laboratory uh, as well. And he's one of these people that the moment he starts any physical activity, it's like a flood warning, yeah. right? He just soaks through clothing. It's just the, the sweating adaptation is, is exceedingly robust in him. Other people less so. So is it true that sweating and our ability to dump heat through it by lo loss of water is something that um, we tend to vary on and that also that we can build up that capacity? I know a number of people are probably thinking, ew, gross, why would I want to sweat more? But there's actually a huge advantage to be able to dump body heat during exertion because body heat in some ways sets the cap for performance. In many, many ways. Including mental yeah. performance. More our sure. ability to stay alert often is enhanced by being cold. And of course, we all want to warm up properly. but. Um, in terms of loss of fluid through sweating, is there a way to easily bin ourselves into kind of a, a low sweater, medium sweater, um, heavy sweater? That sure. sounds like a, an article of clothing. But in any case, you know what I'm. You know, man, I'm another a lot to say here. We should, wish we had a whole series on this. Um, Listen, if we have to go 17 hours, we can do it. Just everybody hydrate well. I and, think we've shown the listeners uh, that is a real threat. That's a very real threat. Podcasting to failure. You don't have to do every set in the gym to failure, but here we are attempting to podcast to failure. In it, in all seriousness, yes. um, what what is the role of sweating ability? And is this something that any of us should care about or yeah. train for or pay attention to? Or is this just kind of getting into the arcane? Number one, you can train your ability to sweat. This is important for heat acclimation. And why that matters, when you sweat, that actually is not what regulates your temperature. Uh, you, what you want to have happen is the fluid to hit your skin and that to be evaporated. That's the actual mechanism. So in fact, um, if you stop sweating, like you can guarantee within a short amount of time, you're going to be done moving. Oh, very interesting. I hope people heard that and really are, are highlighting that in their mind, that sweating is a process of bringing fluid from your body onto the surface of your skin. And then the heat dumping aspect of sweating is the evaporation of that off, off your body, which brings to mind all sorts of ideas about how to dress during exercise, et cetera. But what you said is that if you are not sweating enough, you are limiting your output capacity. So it's not just about having enough fluid to sweat. Yep. It's also about being able to sweat and being uh, dressed appropriately to allow that sweat to move, uh, to evaporate off your body. Yep, and heat acclimation training is as simple as it sounds. So just practice it more. So uh, if you're going into a process where you either need to be in a hot environment or you need to improve your sweat rate, you just need to practice sweating and your body will get better to that. Uh, practice the sauna, practice the jacuzzi, just get in those things and you will uh, improve your ability to do that. Now, there is a huge genetic component. Uh, I have one individual, actually uh, a UFC fighter I've been working with, and I don't mind mentioning his name. He'll give me full permission. Scott Holtzman, uh, many, many years. Um, he's actually um, fighting right now. Actually, today he'll be going. He is like, he, he is like you described, like buckets and buckets and buckets of fluids come off this guy when he's tying his shoes. Like he just goes, right? Like, and we've, we've improved that. I actually sweat too much. We worked on that a lot early in his career and we, we got some improvements down to get him to hold on to, to fluids better. That being said, uh, I've worked with other individuals in his weight category and it's the opposite, right? So we can have them literally do the exact same training session together and Scott will dump six pounds and, and other folks at his size will dump two, two and a half. So there's a genetic component that is just there and you don't need to worry about it there. Um, so can you identify if you are a heavy salt sweater or not? Well, you have a whole bunch of routes for this. Number one is you can use the old free, um, cost free test of just looking at your clothing. And if you're seeing that white residue all over it, so you you all have the friend who probably wears that same bas baseball hat that they've had for eight years. If it is covered in the white junk all over the place, um, that's a, a sign of a higher salt sweater. If the opposite happens, and it's like you can pull their clothing back and, and there's just nothing there, um, they are maybe a little bit of a lower salt sweater. Um, you can also use any number of uh, hydration tests. I know that there is some coming out in the market very, very soon that can give you theoretically real time um, measurements. It's like a CGM would be, uh, although I haven't seen any data on if those are accurate or not. I haven't used one yet, uh, but there are a number that are out uh, super cheap, you know, 10, 15, 20 bucks, all the way up to a couple hundred dollars. You can buy these patches, put them on you and get a reasonably close estimate. Um, and again, if those things are five or 10 or 20% off, I don't know, 
uh, have to see independent data come out first. But even if they are, you're not, you're not worried about the specific milligrams, right? Whether you sweat out, you know, 1,250 milligrams in a workout or if it's 1,340, it doesn't really matter. You're trying to look for big, big numbers, right? Are you losing 500 milligrams? Are you using three and a half grams where you're at? So those things will get you in the ballpark to do exactly what you just said. Am I high, medium, or low? Um, and there's a lot of them that, that I've used in the past. So that, that's another way to go about it. Um, then what you want to do is probably match your electrolyte intake to something close to what you sweat. That's the ideal scenario. Um, you can get a lot of information about hydration from blood. Um, you can look at like acute markers of dehydration, like hemoglobin, hematocrit. Uh, if you're like, if your hemoglobin is like 15 plus, it's funny. <laughs> We've talked about this in a few episodes before, but I see that and I'm like, man, that dude's super fit. That's a, like a 15 uh, for hemoglobin would be pretty high. 14 or so would be pretty good for a female. That's also the exact same thing as the sign of acute dehydration. Um, so hematocrit, same thing. If you're north of 50%, you're probably dehydrated. So you can get a lot. There are also though a lot of biomarkers that can tell you more about chronic dehydration. So you can run through those things as well. So a good blood chemistry test can tell you a lot. And you can actually get some insights in your sodium and potassium. Albumin is another fantastic way to, to measure longer term uh, hydration status. Another one of these amazing globulins that we've sort of talked a lot about. So you can do all those things. You can also simply measure the body weight pre and post and use a sweat patch or not and use the, the freer version of your clothing test and get a rough idea uh, of where you're getting it from. So those are good places to start. Um, I want to go back though and make sure I wasn't over terrifying the audience too much on a sober piece. If you're performing a type of training or exercise or sport in which you're not losing more than 2% of your body weight, you don't need to be overly concerned about hydrating in the sport. And so we can actually get into the, to, um, some equations for how much water to drink during training right now. But if, you, if you're, again, losing less than that, it's not critical. You can have some fluids if it like, makes you feel better, but you're not gonna be experiencing tremendous amounts of performance sacraments if you're, you know, again, out playing a, a baseball game and it's 50 degrees out, you're fine. Um, you can drink some water, but that's not gonna be compromising performance or recovery. So uh, we can actually then, if you'd like, I can go through the three-step system for optimizing hydration, but uh, those are, I, I wanna make sure I planted that flag so people aren't just terrified that they gotta be guzzling down water if they're, you know, going to their physical therapist for some stretching. That's, that's probably not super important.